Okay, everyone, we're going to start with our next session. Um, and we are welcoming um, a, a live streaming audience joining at this point. And for the live stream external viewers, just to uh, inform you that we are close to concluding a two-day uh, meeting here at the Carter Center in Atlanta on Native American participation in U.S. elections, and that's federal, state, and local elections, and the challenges and barriers to effective participation. And we as a group have been trying to think about those challenges and what can be done. Uh, it's included participants uh, from tribes, state-level officials, academics, um, NGOs, and other advocates for Native American rights, um, international organizations. We've also had rep uh, representatives of national institutions in both Mexico and Canada. And we're fortunate to have a video message from the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as well. And also had uh, one of the two first uh, women elected to US Congress joining us for the opening session yesterday. So we're, we're very, very pleased. Um, in this session, uh, we're going to have a panel discussion to kind of review some of the summary conclusions and main points that have come out of these two days and uh, have a panel discussion with the panelists here to my right and then open it up to participation from those of you in the room and possibly also from the live stream participants. So I'm happy to introduce the panelists to my immediate right is uh, co-chair of the meeting and the Secretary of State of Washington, Kim Wyman. Uh, to her right is Natalie Landreth, who is a senior staff attorney at the Native American Rights Fund. And finally, to the far right is Brian Newby, who is the executive director of the U.S. Electoral Assistance Commission. So welcome again to, to this panel. Um, I have several questions that I'd like to put to some of you individually, but mostly to the group, to start our conversation. And I'm going to start first with a question to, to Natalie, if, if you don't mind and to ask, uh, can you share a little bit about some of the high-level outcomes that have occurred as a result of the Native American uh, Voting Rights Coalition field hearings, which has been a topic of a lot of the discussion, uh, especially yesterday? Mm -hmm. So uh, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you again. As if we haven't said it enough, I really want to thank the Carter Center for hosting. I want to thank Avery and David in particular for you know putting the real blood, sweat, and tears into arranging a meeting of this size to Jacqueline uh, and Jim, Patty, and Virginia for arranging. All of you were selected, chosen to be here for your work in your fields, and people put a lot of thought into it. So thank you um, really for doing this. So this was the first time that the Native American Voting Rights Coalition presented um, the top level results of its field hearings. The purpose of the field hearings was to document barriers to registration and voting, and then to educate the public and come up with public policy or other remedies to address these issues. Um, and the, the high level outcomes, what we were able to see from the 30,000 foot level was really surprising. I think to a lot of people, the, the number, the breadth, and the depth of first generation barriers, which are actual impediments to voting that still exist in Indian country, they include a lack of polling places the, a lack of registration access, which is even worse due to the challenges presented by the non-traditional addresses often used on reservations and in Indian communities. A problem further compounded by the fact that almost 16% of the um, native population is homeless or temporarily homeless, such as what's called couch surfing or something similar. Um, another issue that they faced is that there is little to no outreach whatsoever to these communities. Many Native American voters living on reservations have never in their lives seen a voter registration drive. Um, there was an illiteracy rate compounded and created by other forms of discrimination, such as educational discrimination and the legacy of the boarding schools. The poverty exacerbated all these problems because it means you simply have less access to transportation to address your own barriers. And then the, um, I think what, one of the more surprising things um, in this room, I think I could sense by the reaction was the presence of actual modern day voter intimidation by people in communities that are outside polling places in their uniforms with their hand on a gun or something similar that you just 
didn't think really existed anymore. That was another thing that we got a firsthand testimony on. And finally, one of the interesting and I think surprising folks to a lot of people that work in the voting community is just how mail-in voting may not be a very good fit. And ours was not the first study to look at something like that, but when you combine the access to the postal services, which is not much better than access to registration or polling places, with the non-traditional addresses and the challenges of homelessness and poverty all combined, it means that mail-in voting may not work as well as it does in a lot of communities and the way that it's presented as a um, one way to increase voter access or participation is simply not going to fit this community that well. So those were the high level things that have come out of the hearings um, thus far. Thanks. Now I'd, I'd like to ask a question that I hope all three of you can respond to and maybe um, Secretary Wyman could, could speak first and then um, Brian Newby and then uh, Natalie, you could follow up third. And I'd like to ask all of you, in, um, upon reflection of these last two days, what did you learn? What did you take away that was something that you were not really so cognizant of before we met? Well, thank you, David. I appreciate the, uh, uh, the opportunity to be here and the work that the Carter Center did to bring all of us to this, this room has been really powerful from my perspective. I serve as the chief election officer for my state and my state is vote by mail, so I'll be making context, uh, comments in the next few minutes uh, related to that. But I think the things that surprised me um, about particularly the, the study results um, were one, just the, the challenges that are faced by members of the Native American community in being able to cast a ballot in you know 2018, an era that I believed we had gotten rid of these barriers and that we were really doing a good job of uh, meeting the needs of our voters across the country and certainly in my state. Um, but the, the more surprising thing to me was the, the cultural challenges that I was really unaware of until probably yesterday. Um, so first, the mechanical things related to an election, um, the challenges of um, a, a very highly mobile mobile population related to address. Um, this is something in, in states like mine that conduct all elections by mail, we're acutely aware of because about 10% of our population moves every year. So we spend a great amount of time just making sure people's addresses are current so we can get ballots to them. And we have some pretty big challenges in the Native American communities in my state. So I know that uh, we need to be doing a more outreach to those communities and really finding out um, how we can address things like our non-traditional addresses. Again, something when I walked in the door 48 hours ago, I believed we had already addressed. In my state, we do we deal with a homeless population and having non-traditional addresses. But I now I'm going to have to do a gut check and make sure that I'm that we're doing it as well as I thought we were. Um, in terms of the cultural challenges, I think. Um, Again, we need to do a better job of getting into um, the communities, particularly in my state, I need to do a better job of getting into those communities and uh, finding out if the drop boxes are working and what else we can do to improve voter registration because um, what I learned, I guess, and, and this may sound silly that it was new to me, the distrust of government officials, particularly, uh, you know, state government officials is, uh, is pretty high. And, you know, I need to be doing a better job of, of reaching out to those communities. One of the things we learned yesterday is even what you wear. Uh, the first time I went to the Yakima Nation, I wore a suit. And I learned yesterday that that was probably a mistake. And, uh, and, and those cultural differences, you know, it's, I can kind of laugh at it now, but those are things that, that we need to be exposed to and we need to learn about. And um, I think that they are going to go a long way to helping us solve the problems that we identified in the last two days. Well, first of all, I'd like to, on behalf of EAC Chair Thomas Hicks and EAC Vice Chair Christy McCormick, uh, thank you uh, and thank the Carter Center for having this fascinating and timely discussion. So thank you very much for that. I think, uh, at least I can speak for myself and, and I think many others, I, I came into this session thinking that we'd be talking a lot about language assistance and language issues. and. Uh, so I was really kind of blown away about the discussion that this is an underserved, underrepresented 
uh, group of voters. And uh, just some of the things that Natalie was saying were, were just fascinating to me. There's, uh, I would say, address issues, registration issues, uh, representation among the election workers, election administration, uh, and, and some of that, just to dive into that, the, it makes sense that if you don't have an address or you're constantly moving, that you're more likely to be removed from the voter registration list as part of the National Voter Registration Act process. So that, that seems very, uh, makes sense to me, I guess. It just didn't, I didn't equate it with all of this at the time. Uh, something that I think that we've thought about at the EAC before is, you know, we like to say that we're a very diverse community and that's, that's diversity is great. But the fact is voters feel more comfortable when they go into a polling place and they see other voters who look like them or uh, just act like them or just some part of their culture. And so just like we think that there'd be more participation with people who are disabled by having election workers who are disabled. Similarly, what we learned was that we don't have many, uh, much representation with persons who are Native American in polling places. And that would be something that probably would drive turnout. What we saw and we learned was the registration and the turnout rates were lower in the Native American community than elsewhere. I, I think if there's any good thing about all this, and I think there is a good thing about it, is as I listen to this in my own orientation, these are election administration issues, I think, more than uh, a very specific issue. I'm not diminishing the specificness that we've discussed here, but as an election administrator, I think these are areas that uh, in my previous job in local election administration we focused on, and I think that we can provide guidance at the EAC in the same regard to help address all of these, because these are really issues that are universal to all voting situations. Uh, and so for my part, I imagine all of us have really different expertise and different things that we work on every day. And you become very enmeshed in what you know and you understand. And I was very surprised that people were not at all aware of a lot of these issues because we're so accustomed to dealing with them in our office and the field hearings took 10 months to complete and we heard a lot of the same issues over and over again. So. I'm surprised at the level to which even people who administer elections did not, even ones with Indian populations in their states did not understand a lot of these issues. And I think it has created a real obligation on our part. You know, I don't want to get ahead of the discussion, but I think it creates a real obligation to take all of this information and begin to really educate people. Because the second part of what I re really learned is that in this room, and I imagine many others that are not in this room, once you have that information, there's an enormous amount of receptivity to addressing a lot of it, whereas many of us are, are litigators. We'll go have one meeting, two meeting, or something, and then you send a notice letter, and then you bring your lawsuit, and then you're on, at different tables for the next three or, or 10 years if you're Lachlan. Um, and uh, it, it's, a very, it's the hardest solution. It's the most difficult solution, and I think this report and what we've provided from what I've learned in this room is perhaps an excellent opportunity to really approach people we may not have approached before with a lot of this information and say, we'd like to share this with you and see if we can start talking about some solutions. So I really appreciate that. I have to say on a smaller note, I really appreciated learning about um, the international aspect of it. I was shocked and so like gladdened to hear about the way um, the election laws in Mexico, that you have to have 50% women and 50% men. And I thought, we're way behind. <laughs> but I was really impressed by that. And I think that, um, again, appreciating the real role that the Carter Center has played here by bringing all of these, diverse, I would never have known that. And I think it presents an excellent opportunity to keep these groups connected in some way that, so that we can continue to learn from each other. Yes, we have a, a great deal to learn from our neighbors to the north and to the south. Um, uh, as you've uh, alluded to, um, Natalie, you, the three of you represent different perspectives on these issues that we've been talking about. Uh, my next question, there's just two more questions, is uh, what are the are there other key messages about Native American participation uh, in the United States elections that you would share with others who work with you in your fields? Just go this way. Oh, go again? Okay. 
I think there's a, a number of them, and in my in my world, I consider myself an election administrator first. It's it's where my roots are, even though I'm an, a partisanly elected official now. Um, my colleagues in the Association of Secretaries of State and the National State Elections Directors, um, and I work very closely in in the administrative side of elections, and I think that. In the modern era, one of the biggest disservices we've had probably in the last 20 years, and I would mark it with uh, Gore v. Bush, um, is that partisanship is really undermining the messages of how to have a good election. And I think that we all are going to see the world through our partisan eyes. I, I don't think we'll ever change that. But the way we talk about things gets tainted by that. And for example, when I came into this, this meeting, my perspective was a lot of the litigation that happens is on both sides is designed to set up in case your candidate doesn't win. And then if we don't win at the polls, we can win in court. And I, I think that there is some of that, but I think that um, that has diluted the impact the work a lot of you around this table do because it's easy for election administrators to assume that the litigation is really partisanly motivated and it's not really dealing with an administrative issue. That it's really trying to advance the Democratic Party or it's really trying to advance the Republican Party's candidate. And um, what we talked about today, and, and I, I'll come back to it a little later, is that's undermining our ability to serve our voters. That, that partisanship is really eating away at our ability to make sure that every single person who's eligible has a chance to register and vote. And I say that from a perspective of um, election administrators, because <laughs> that's, that's where my heart is. <laughs> oh, I can't believe I'm crying on the internet. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I do that all the time. Um, but, <laughs> but, you know, I, there, there are 8,000 of us uh, at the local to the state level and I have had 25 years of working with these people. And I can tell you, okay. Uh, channel Jimmy Carter, channel Jimmy Carter, channel Jimmy Carter. <laughs> um, I can tell you that in my entire career, in those 25 years, I haven't met an election official who is trying to disenfranchise people on both sides of the aisle. And I say that because the work is so important, and, and we take oaths of office to uphold the Constitution and the Constitution and laws of our state. And, and I, in the election officials that I've dealt with through the years, all take that seriously, take it to heart, and really want to make democracy better in the same exact way every one of you around the table wants to do. And so we have to bridge that partisan gap and get past it to get to the heart of these issues that are creating real barriers. And I'll come back to the, the other um, in a minute in my comments because I can tell you that yesterday I was shocked <laughs> that we're solving problems that we should have solved 40 years ago. Okay, <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> well, I think what I might do is add on to that. But I first want to say that uh, I think we were told this would be a safe house, and even though it's the internet, hopefully there's no internet memes. I, that's all pledged that there's none. But I think the thing that was discussed, I just want to add on to that, that um, I think we, we had a breakout group, and we talked about this a lot in election administration, and uh, Steve Trout actually had been at an audit conference earlier this week, and, or last week, and he kind of raised something to me and made me think about it. Post-election audits are all the rage right now and talking about those, but election officials should also audit other components of their elections and, and looking at that. And one component, one thing we wrote as a, I guess a, a message was, have you served all voters equally? And I would just add in, to what Secretary Wyman said, that that was stunning to me. That I don't think, I, I don't know any election official who would not want to make sure that all, all voters are able to cast a vote. I just don't, don't believe that. And I think to the point about the oath, Election officials have a duty, I mean, because that's what the oath is. They have a duty to make sure that everyone is able to vote and, and an equal representation. So uh, I thought that was a very, very powerful thing that we learned. And I, I get to a place where one, you know, again, I keep going back to the election administration component. For us at the EAC, we think there are things that we can do uh, and support election officials that are sort of like the basics of election administration, but they don't get talked about as much. One is street file maintenance and helping making sure, you know, the idea is that 
uh, you want to make sure people get the proper, we know where they, they live so that they get the proper ballot. And the, the reason you want to get them the proper ballot is so that they have the proper person representing them because it's all uh, uh, government representation. And so that's where I get to the duty. We have a duty to make sure that people are uh, being able to vote for their correct representative. And street file maintenance is something I think you'll see uh, an initiative from the EAC that we'll be working on a lot to provide guidance on that. Unrelated to this conference, this just provides a great theme and a great reason to make it a higher priority. Um, so I think for my part in terms of key messages about Native American participation that I would share with others in my field, I think honestly, um, we live in this uh, world, uh, my colleagues and I at NARF who work on voting law, where we even work, interact with other voting attorneys a lot. And I think, frankly, even they don't understand the depth and breadth of the issues that we're talking about. So I think, you know, related to what I had mentioned in the earlier question is that we really have an obligation to not only educate publicly to wherever people are willing to listen to us, but also to deal with the larger uh, voting community because I think people don't understand um, the intersection and how complex a lot of these issues because other communities have moved on to dealing with second generation barriers. Things about vote dilution when we're still dealing with the fact that people can't access a polling place. So I think a lot of that needs to be done. You know, you take care of your own home first. So we need to work in that community. But I think we have actual impediments to voting in the Native com American community. And I think it surprised me to hear you say you think a lot of the lawsuits are partisan. I can say honestly that whenever we're gearing up for a lawsuit from our perspective, it's always because we find it deeply offensive that someone isn't allowed to vote. And we're gonna fix that problem, and I'm gonna, if I have to sue somebody for 10 straight years, like I'm gonna do it because I'm gonna fix that. And that's your legacy is that you're speaking on behalf of people who have no other way to fix it. And so if people can take that away also from what we looked at yesterday is that you're looking at communities that aren't suing your states for partisan reasons. They're suing because there's, for, for however it came about, whether it's this is our practice, this is our regulation, this is what our law says, that they're experiencing an actual barrier. And that's just not acceptable in the United States uh, or anywhere else. And frankly, we're just going to be around to do something about it. Thanks. One, one last question to the panel, and then we'll, we'll open it up. And this will overlap a little bit, I think, with some of the things you've already said. Uh, but um, what are some of the next steps that you can identify that people who work in your professional fields could take to either further the conversation that we've been having here today or actually start to implement some of the recommendations that we've identified? Okay, just go in the same order. Um, well, I, I hope to see in both the Secretaries of State Association and even regional uh, state associations like our auditors and clerks and networks uh, having meetings like this uh, regional. And one of the things I'm hoping to do when I go back home is to coordinate with uh, Oregon and Colorado and probably California because. Uh, California's gonna be vote by mail soon too. Um, and have a regional conver a conversation with people like you in, in our areas and find out what things we can be doing better and, and really get into the weeds and figure out um, what we can do to, uh, to address not only, quite honestly, the Native American underserved populations, but other un underserved populations in my state and in those states and, and how we can use vote, vote by mail better. Um, and I think the other thing is, I, I was sharing with you kind of this paradigm shift that I've had in the last, uh, like I said, 24 hours, I would say. And, um, and, it, and I'm not trying to dismiss the, the litigation. I'm just saying that I think it's easy to view the litigation in a, in a, that it's partisanly motivated, that it's not really a, a mechanical issue. Um, and I guess what I would ask those of you in the room um, who may look at, at the efforts of election officials with the same type of paradigm shift don't assume that whatever the activity is, um, and I'm trying to use examples that won't get, get a, a visceral reaction, but don't assume that some administrative change is always done to try to be a negative effect or an impact on a voting block. Because there actually could sometimes be a real, what seems like a really logical reason, it's gonna save money or whatever, and not to use that as an excuse, but that we're, we're trying to do this to make it better. 
it might be that those election officials don't know and haven't thought through that cultural impact. Because I can tell you, uh, again, three weeks ago when I looked at some of the, the allegations being made uh, you know, in some of the heated races, I looked through my partisan lens and went, oh, well, that's just, you know, that's just a Republican Party trying to hedge their bet, or it's just a Democratic Party trying to hedge their bet. And, and now I'm going to take that step back before I just leap to that conclusion. And I think that it's important for all of us to do that because this is too important. And I think a lot of the um, criticisms that came up, or at least constructive ideas and suggestions that came up from the interviews that you did um, in my state, at first I, I was sort of you know, railing against it, like, oh, well, you know, no, my, my voters are fine. They're, they're all getting ballots and it's all good. And disconnecting that and realizing that those partisan attacks, and for me in the campaign, they had been partisan attacks, there may be something that I can do that can improve those, and how can I work with those communities better to do it? And I think that if we do that, we can get past these, uh, these first generation barriers, I love that term, I never thought of it that way, and really make sure that we're, uh, we're able to, to move forward. Um, so I think, <clears throat> Echoing what I've been mentioning, I think in terms of next steps, the very first thing that we have to do is compile the full report about a lot of the information that was here, make sure that we share all of that with people, look for all opportunities to present this information. So if your organization group um, is interested in hearing more about this, your particular Secretary of State's office, I think that's something that NARF and other members of the coalition Native American Voting Rights Coalition would be happy to do. I think, frankly, these problems were so widespread, we found them all over the place, that it's not practical to whack-a-mole state by state, county by county. We need to look for broader policy solutions to avoid these same issues. They're unacceptable. They should garner bipartisan support. One of those approaches is to look at Senator Udall's Native American Voting Rights Act, which, and I have to commend Senator Udall's office, they heard about the field hearings and collected transcripts in advance. So while this information that you all saw here hasn't been presented to them in the aggregate in the same way that you've seen it, they went through the transcripts to try and find issues that they could address perhaps legislatively. And so there is a piece of legislation that will be uh, in this current Congress to address some of these, and I really strongly encourage people to support that um, across the aisle and to work on making it exactly what you need it to be because it's, uh, it's simply unacceptable the status of uh, Native American voting barriers all across the country. So the other thing I'd like to offer as a next step is the idea that we really follow up on this meeting because um, many of us in this room are, are members of the Native American Voting Rights you know, Coalition where we see each other and talk about these problems all the time, but we need bridges to state legislatures. We need bridges to secretaries of state to talk to them, to have the kind of dialogue you're talking about, bridges to the international community so that we can learn from them um, because it looked to me like they were facing some of the similar challenges. Um, and have found some great solutions. So I think there, if I could have one next step, it would also be to create some mechanism to have a follow-on for the conversation we've begun here. Well, from the EAC's perspective, this conference, it comes at a great time because it's at the end of the year, leading into a calendar year of assessing what has occurred in the 2018 election, thinking about our activities in 2020 uh, and then in 2019, but also, uh, the AC is really on the cusp of having two new commissioners. We have to have two uh, who have gone through committee um, approval, and now they have to be confirmed by the U.S. Senate. We hope that will happen, and then we will head into 2019 with four commissioners for the first time in about 10 years. And in doing that, also, be, we're going to be meeting with the, the whole body of commissioners and talking about priorities uh, for 2019. So all of that to say that this is a great time to be discussing uh, this event, but also then the broader context of what we can do. And I do think from the EAC perspective, at the, in terms of election administrators, we're challenging ourselves to make sure that everything we do helps election administrators do their jobs better. So this, this concept of uh, the underserved and underrepresented uh, segments is good for us because we want to be looking at, again, street file maintenance guidance for the National Voter Registration Act, uh, guidance on mail, 
uh, language um, issues in general, glossaries, we had some good feedback that the glossaries have provided value for uh, others, so we want to look at that again and see if we should um, update those with other languages or at least just update those. And we've also had language summits for the last three years, and um, I think now with the, what we've learned here, we can discuss that with the commissioners and discuss how that might fit in the context of 2019 and 2020, not just language summits, but also maybe again making bringing these issues to light for election administrators. I, I would say the one thing um, uh, I think uh, we've got to know a lot of people here and, and one of the things I heard uh, was in terms of looking at solutions sometimes trying to, rather than litigate, uh, trying to come up with a, an end run or another way to do something that might be faster. And I, I just would issue or echo what Secretary Wyman said that I think for me, trying to understand and hear different and new issues is, is great, a new paradigm. But also, I think um, I'm not suggesting maybe doing it in, in any crazy way, but understanding the orientation of an election administrator, knowing that, I, and I truly believe that they are focused mostly on making sure everybody has the opportunity to vote. In that orientation, that might be a different way to approach uh, and try and get uh, election administrator buy-in. But uh, overall, I think from the EAC standpoint, we just have a lot of initiatives that we're planning to do. This um, helps us prioritize those, uh, and I think you're going to see uh, a lot of those activities, the street file maintenance especially, early in 2019. Thank you, Brian, and thank you to all the panelists. Um, we have, I think, almost uh, a little bit less than 30 minutes left in the session. So at this point, we'd like to uh, open the conversation up to uh, primarily everybody in the room, but also if there are live stream participants, we'll, we'll welcome questions or comments from them. Uh, I would encourage both the same questions we've been discussing, but if you have others, feel free. And those are you know, key messages that um, uh, we've, you know, you'd like to send to your professional communities. What are some of the important things that you've learned here that uh, maybe you were not aware of fully before or maybe you were not aware of at all? And any next steps that could be taken, again, in your professional communities, but if you have suggestions for others, to move this down the road and hopefully move towards some implementation of, of concrete action. So uh, happy to take any questions around the room and to help me flag your, uh, your name thing, if, if you could. And I see Wendy Underhill from NCSL. I'm very happy to recognize you. Uh, thank you very much. We heard something from David LeBlanc from Canada earlier that struck me. And I wonder if there's another way that we could um, double down on that. He told us that when in Canada they've made administrative changes that supported the uh, voting for First Nations peoples, that those same changes were helpful for all voters. And I wonder if we can find any parallels. And I say this partly, uh, I'm literally just asking, but also would that be something we want to share with other people as we go forward? Mm -hmm. And is, uh, that's a question to the panel, or do you mean? Yes, that? but if anybody else wanted to respond, that's okay too. Okay, and so how about I'll maybe take three questions and let the panelists kind of comment in general. And so I see um, Jim, OJ, and then Dan. I'll take four since we got four registered. Jim, and I guess I just had four additional observations I wanted to make really quick because I think these are common themes that we had out. One is that we understand as litigators that election administrators are facing resource issues, but one of the things that we've also heard consistently is that what kind of price are you gonna place on the fundamental right to vote? And that's the feedback that we've gotten. Um, the second point is that we understand that oftentimes things like mail-in voting come along and they're sold as a cost savings measure, but what has happened in some cases, I think, is that there are certain underserved populations that they may not, there may not be sufficient consideration of what the impact of those um, measures could actually be on the populations. That kind of leads into the third point, which is, it's literally the standard that we apply when we look at Section 203 cases. The perspective that really should be adopted not, should not be one from a litigator, it shouldn't be from one, one from an election administrator. It should be a bottom-up approach from the, from the perspective of the voter and specifically the voter from the particular community you're looking at. Because what we found is that what may be effective for urban voters may be really, really bad and may not work at all um, in, in geographically and linguistically and culturally isolated portions of Indian country. 
And then finally, that kind of leads into the last point, which I, I think was a very consistent theme that we heard was the need for greater dialogue and communication. Because one of the things, again, I think that we've seen is that, and I think part of what we're getting in terms of feedback on why a lot of people are surprised that these first generation barriers are there is because there hasn't been sufficient dialogue and, and communication between you know, the, the, really the, the consumers, the customers, which are the voters, and the election administrators. Um, it's certainly never our preference to be in a position that we have to bring litigation. And I'm sure Natalie would have loved to, loved to have her 10 years back that we spent up in Alaska suing the state of Alaska. <laughs> but I think these are kind of the dominant themes that we've seen that really contributed to situations in which we may eventually find ourselves where we do actually have to bring a last resort, which is the litigation. OJ, Simmons, and then uh, Dan McCool. Um, yeah, I just have a few comments. You know, um, I, I'm glad you brought up the partisan issue. I mean, um, w whenever we start uh, trying to work out an issue in Indian country uh, on voter denial, uh, we don't go directly to Secretary of State. We go to the county commissioner and we go to the local county official and, and we start talking. And in, in some cases, we have offered to cover all the costs that it may uh, uh, cost the county to do this. Um, and what, the only time litigation fails or, or happens is when they refuse to even think about what we're doing. Um, and so in, in, in South Dakota, they said it was a partisan issue and we were for the Democrats, and it, it was the Republican Secretary of State. In Montana, they said it was a Republican deal because we were soon Democrats. Uh, just recently in Arizona, both parties sued and they came to a settlement on how to cure votes. Not one of the parties talked to, to the Navajo Nation. So the Navajo Nation sued. And we got the Republicans mad, and we got the Democrats mad. So this issue, and I, I'm glad you bring it up, you can't look at it as a partisan issue because this is actual a native issue. And if you look at it, we've really been successful. It's only because it's so outrageous of what we have to do. But that does not mean that what we're bringing to your attention isn't happening to other people. And, and so I, I hope as we go along that, that this discussion, when you have a meeting with Secretary of State, you should invite people from other organizations and say, hey, this is what's going on. And it's not a partisan issue, it's a, uh, the backbone of democracy. <clears throat> One of the things I've been saying over and over is that the backbone of democracy, the spine's been kicked so many times, it may not stand up too long. And I, I see this as a way to take and heal that backbone. And so I thank the Carter Center, uh, Alex, David, Sarah, uh, for putting this together. I, I hope that this type of communication can keep on going, uh, where we, we can do something without litigation. Thank you. Thanks. And then last, uh, Dan McCool for this round, and then I invite all the panelists to please respond, comment as you choose. We, we've talked an awful lot about litigation these past two days, but I think everybody in the room would agree that if we could solve these problems collaboratively, that would be preferable. And uh, that's my other field of research, collaboration. Uh, people need training in collaboration. How you design a collaborative process affects the outcome, affects the potential for success, and to make it inclusive, you have to give people a, a sense of being a part of it, which again requires some kind of training. And what I would envision, my, my wish list, would be uh, a collaborative workshop that included uh, state, local, and tribal election officials in the same room getting the same collaborative uh, uh, workshop so they could all learn how to get along together, how to resolve things without going to court. And a collaborative workshop would be one where there is not a substantive electoral issue at stake. They're just learning 
how to solve these problems uh, together. And, and I'm, I'm curious, did, is there any training in, to teach people how to collaborate, how to get along without going to court? <laughs> Secretary Wyman, and then down the line. Sure. Uh, there was a lot there to comment on. Um, I'll dial in on a, a couple of the comments that Jim made. Um, first of all, funding. And certainly you hear that a lot from election officials. And I guess one of the caveats I would ask you all to remember is realize I don't get to set my budget. I can ask the legislature for my budget, but it's up to them to, to provide me with the money. And that's true of every jurisdiction from county to, to local governments that conduct elections. And so we're competing with, uh, when I was at the county, for example, we're competing with law enforcement and public health and roads and things that affect people's you know, kitchen table. Elections are something th people think about for many voters once every four years. So there isn't necessarily this groundswell of support of people saying, by God, yes, we need to get a new voting system. Usually what, where that comes from is when something goes catastrophically wrong. And the best example I can give to all of you is, is uh, Bush v. Gore. And of course, I like to be bipartisan. In my state, we had a very close uh, governor's race about 14 years ago that uh, went the other way. And in both cases, we saw sweeping legislation and money that came out of that. That one-time money isn't going to fit fix the problems. I never use that term. Let me let me strike that. You never say fix or stuff when you're talking about elections. You can correct long-term problems with one-time money. You can't do it. It needs to be an ongoing discussion, just like the discussions we're having right now about how you make sure registration is accessible and that elections are accessible and secure. We have to have those discussions now when there isn't an election at stake. When you try to have these same conversations in the middle of an election cycle, now it becomes a partisan debate because obviously either side is trying to do it because they're trying to let their candidates win. And so we need to have these tough discussions and change the laws when you're not in an election cycle, when no one has any skin in the game, and when you actually can have a more balanced, fair, dis gosh, that's a bad one too. I am just on a roll here, not a fair and balanced because that would be very partisanly driven too. Um, having a discussion that is a discussion, and it can be a heated debate, but it doesn't have to be an argument. And we can mediate these things and come up with, with good long-term discussions, and that's really what needs to happen. And instead of having an infusion of money once every 20 years, we need to look at how we're going to fund our, our infrastructure of elections, and I mean not only physical infrastructure, but the people. Um, we, it needs to be ongoing so that these discussions uh, don't have to happen anymore. So thank you for the questions and comments. I want to touch on some points that I heard from uh, Wendy Underhill from NCSL. Talked about how Mr. LeBlanc said when you, you know, sort of respond to the concerns of the indigenous community, it often helps other voters. This is a perfect example of that because, um, as I mentioned, almost 16% of the Native American population is homeless or homeless at some point seasonally. But if you address that, you are helping the homeless population in general no matter what community they may be from? Or what about other rural voters who may have the same P.O. box problem living in rural Kansas or Nebraska? If you fix that issue where you're accepting non-traditional addresses, you are helping those people as well. And so I think that's an excellent message. If you lift up a lot of these native voters, you are lifting up other similarly situated people in the American populace. You really are, it just benefits everybody. Second, I want to mention something that Jim talked about. He did raise cost as an issue, and I just wanted to remind people one of the curious things we've encountered as litigate, litigators, and I say we in the royal sense, I really mean OJ has encountered this at Four Directions more than anybody else, is the fact that oftentimes um, they will be told, well, um, we'll give you your satellite or early voting location as long as you pay for it. Unacceptable. You, you, I challenge you to go to any other community in the United States and tell them they have to pay their poll tax to vote. Um, but people seem to tolerate that for Native American communities, and a lot of people may not be aware of that. You cannot do that. You cannot then just shift it to one specific community. The resources have to be allocated differently to address everybody. Um, the third is also something mentioned by Mr. LeBlanc that you know came to mind here when listening to uh, OJ from Four Directions is that Native communities are not a monolith, and I don't want to create the impression that by giving you this one 
report that's going to be um, released early next year that the, these solutions, that these issues cross, the first and foremost obligation of anybody conducting an election where there is a Native community is to outreach to that community and to find out what they need and to do that more than once because those relationships um, can take a long time to establish, but once established, you'll find it can address a lot of the issues that you're collectively facing. And lastly, I wanted to mention, there was two brief mentions of litigation and I also wanna, it reminded me, uh, Professor McCool brought up something yesterday that I think maybe people watching or, um, or people that are in the room did not know, which is that when the native community, either tribes or individual Indians sue, they win 95% of the time. 95% of the time. Now I can tell you it's because we're all just super awesome lawyers and that we win 95% of everything and I would love to claim credit, but you know what the real answer is? Is that we're right. And that judges who were appointed by every president across the political spectrum have held in our favor routinely because these are egregious violations that shouldn't exist anymore. And so I think people should realize that a lot of times that when we get to that point, the success rate is due to the fact that these barriers are very, very real. I, I don't know how I can address all these without some personal uh, reflections, so I apologize if it's just me talking maybe more so than the AC, but I guess I, to go through all these, the, I think uh, Dan had asked if about, is there some class on collaborative? And I think that sums up where I think a lot of these issues are. I think they're control issues. They aren't partisan issues. In my old job as election uh, commissioner in Johnson County, Kansas, I'd get a phone call and someone would say, you're obviously a Republican because you did this. And I'd hang up and they'd say, you're obviously a Democrat because you did this. And I'd be like, that's a great day. I just had a, I was just accused to be of both parties in the same day and that, that was a good thing. And what I've noticed is the issues that say OJ is bringing up, they aren't native issues. They aren't partisan issues, they're voter issues. And the voter issues uh, transcend everything. And when you get back to what I was suggesting is control, um, Election administrators generally are funded by someone. And so I really don't believe there are election administrators who would say we can't do something because of cost. I will tell you that election administrators, when you compare them to their peers in county government, state government, they are paid less. Their departments are funded less. I was in a department where I had a, had a unique situation where if I felt we needed to do something to, to serve voters, the county had to pay for that. That was not something the county liked. And they, I mean, I have the scars to prove it from trying to fight for that. I do believe that any election administrator would fight to serve voters. And if, if you're hearing that there's a funding issue or a budget issue, what they may really be saying is, I need your help in selling this issue to the people who are giving me money. I don't think they're saying, I don't have the money, I, I don't see the value. I could be wrong about that, but I, I really do think that the dialogue is more about, um, to what OJ said is the people who are, who are really funding elections, they aren't the election administrators. And, and I really do believe election administrators want to serve voters and I would find some of the stuff we heard today, I, I don't know anyone who wouldn't find it un unacceptable. I think to the last point that Wendy had said about um, you know, doing something in one group as another, we had a, a disability forum at the EAC back in I think April of 2016 and we had someone who was in a wheelchair say, hey, you know, you go to those airports and you used to have to move your uh, suitcase up on the sidewalk and a bump around and now they have these, these pathways and they incline up in the sidewalk and you just wheel it on up. So they didn't create those for you, they created them for me because I'm in a wheelchair. But think about how we all benefit from that. And I think that any kind of voter issue that you would address for one segment generally will help all voters. And so I do believe that, Wendy, you're onto something. I think that is real. We still have um, almost 10 minutes, and so uh, we can take another round of questions. We have one from Steve Trout from Oregon. Thank you, and, and, and thanks again to the Carter Center. I've, I've learned a lot uh, being here the last two days, and hopefully I've, I've done some teaching the last two days as well, because I think, um, you know, all of us talking and, and talking through and realizing how complex a lot of these challenges are, 
but a lot of them are, are, are voter-centered and election administration that, that, that we can focus. And so I just wanted to focus on two things. Um, I, I think there's tremendous value in the 10 months that, that you guys have done um, gathering this data. Um, the more I'm in elections, the more data drives things. And, and that really lets us tell a story that helps with funding, helps with legislation, helps, you know, helps all around because we can say, here, here's a study, here's actual data of actual voters that are being impacted and how they're being impacted. And so, you know, as we've sat here, um, you know, I've heard a number of different data sources that could be looked at. You know, what, you know, what's the difference between those that are registered and voting in tribal elections versus those in, in state and local elections and, and why? And so, you know, I think that's something that we can look into and, and figure out a way to, uh, you know, to, to resolve that. And, and so I think the more, the more we can use data and studies to tell the story, the better, because otherwise it's an anecdote. And I think in my experience, that's when it becomes the kind of more seen through the partisan lens and there's suspicion of it. And so if we can just focus on the facts and, and, and data, that helps rather than an individual telling a story one way or the other. And then the second, um, I had the, uh, the pleasure to sit in the, in the litigation um, um, breakout earlier and, and there was a lot of good discussion and you know there's a lot of great lawyers in the room and um, we, we talked about a number of things but I, I, as I sat there I kept coming back to um, even more than, than collaboration and, and communication is, is education. Um, there's a lot of things that, that you know we all learned about each other's um, activities here this last couple days and there's there's historical reasons why there's some election administration things that happen that really don't make a lot of sense. And honestly, they might not make sense to continue doing them now, but we have to go back and, and, and analyze that and, and look at that and, and come to it, I think as Secretary Wyman said, with the mindset that, you know, there's not an election administrator out there just trying to come up with ways to, to, to make it harder for people. Um, let's try to understand why some of these th things are. There, there's reasons why some jurisdictions put numbers on their voter registration cards and they've got the scars to prove it. We might not need to do it anymore, but, but there's reasons that that came into being. And there's a number of those other things that I think, you know, from the election administrator's perspective, I know that I've been hearing that for 20 years and so I have that experience. I wouldn't expect anybody else at this table to know that. And likewise, you know, many of you have been fighting this battle for more than 20 years of, of rights for, uh, for, uh, for Native Americans. And, you know, there's a lot of those battles that I wasn't aware of and, and issues that, that still haven't been resolved that should have been resolved. And so I think if we can continue to, you know, talk to each other, but then to educate each other and, and educate the local election officials and, and, and educate those people, um, educate our voters on, on what the process is and, and how we can improve that, I think that'll be a success for all of us. Great, thank you. Tammy Patrick from the Democracy Fund, and I know we have at least one more. Thank you. So as I sit here and I'm, um, for the last two days, I think back to my time as an election administrator in Arizona. And one of the most frustrating things that happened when I first started there was hearing from voters about encountering a poll worker or a board worker who had mistreated them and not knowing who that person was so that I could follow up and either educate them or fire them and never hire them again or what have you. So implementing a way to ferret out those bad actors. I would like to say that um, all election officials have altruistic motives and take the oath that they've um, adhered to to heart, but I do know that there are some who have deep-seated hatred and bigotry in their hearts and oftentimes, sadly, they live in border towns to reservations. Um, I come from a family that lived in border towns and reservations in South Dakota. My father was burned in effigy for having Native Americans on his basketball team. I understand that deep-seated hatred, um, that it exists. I don't understand it. So how do we establish when, in fact, there are bad actors? We know that we have the HAVA mechanism in place um, if a voter is denied the right to a private ballot and some other things. How do, we, how do we discuss and how do we come to terms when there are individuals that have taken what I consider a sacred oath in, in preserving our democracy and do not treat voters equally? Um, they are out there. They're, 
thankfully not in large numbers, but I do think that it's the sort of thing that we need to understand who they are, where they are, um, and apply pressure to them to either change their ways or to um, have someone run against them <laughs> or um, someone who has some control and authority over them um, to take, take and make some changes. So I would just, I guess the question would be, um, because I hate it when people start rambling on and don't have a question. So my question is, um, how do we in fact identify those bad actors in a way that can affect change and understanding that some bad actors are acting out of ignorance, some are not. Um, and that's where I think we need to understand how we can quantify that, qualify that, um, and, and remedy. We are getting very close to out of time, and I want to make sure that uh, the panelists each have at least a minute or so to respond. So we have two more questions, but you need to be very brief if you could. Jacqueline de Leon from the Native American Rights Fund. Well, thank you so much. I just want to actually echo what Ms. Patrick said, so I'll keep it brief. You know, I did sit in on all nine of these field hearings, and I have to say uh, it would be a disservice to the tears that I heard you know, and the testimony that I heard of individuals that had to interact with officials that, you know, were acting, you know, against their uh, duties and, and offices. You know, throughout the hearings, um, people were subjected to, frankly, you know, racist, um, and they were denied, denied opportunity, you know, to franchise. And so I don't think that we can, um, I don't think that we can, uh, sit here and say that every election official uh, acts with the best intentions. And I do think we all have a responsibility uh, collectively to, uh, like Ms. Patrick said, ferret out uh, the bad actors. Okay, and I'm, I'm just going to say uh, we have one more question from uh, Ethel Branch from the Navajo Nation, and then I know that uh, Brian will need to leave. So we'll, uh, we'll let you respond first quickly, Brian, after the last question. Um, I guess I, I just have a question of, you know, <laughs> we've had elections in the United States for 242 years, right? Why are we still having these discussions on, you know, how, how we can't seem to get it right? I, I think that's kind of unacceptable. Um, and I think we need to be having a national conversation on, you know, even though best practices was maligned earlier, you know, what, what is the model for how smooth elections can work in the United States for all Americans? Um, and, and, and let's move towards that as a country because, I mean, it's kind of a reflection on our competency to still be at this point where we can't even ensure democratic elections in this country. Um, and so I, I think that's a challenge for, uh, for our nation as a whole. Um, and you know, all of these discussions have reminded me of um, a quote of Felix Cohen who wrote sort of the seminal treatise on Indian law. Um, and, and part of his quote was, like the miner's canary, the Indian marks the shift from fresh air to poison gas in our political atmosphere and our treatment of Indians even more than our treatment of other minorities reflects the rise and fall in our democratic faith. And I think that very much goes to the points that have been made that, you know, if it's good for Indian people, it's going to be good for all Americans because, you know, we're dealing with one of the most impoverished communities, the most disenfranchised communities. Um, so I think if we're, we're focusing on that question of how do we do it better, how do we ensure democratic elections, and how do we make sure that Native American people have that ability to vote easily, I think we'll be going in a good direction, and I'm hopeful that this study is the first of many that need to happen at the regional level and at the state level. Um, but, you know, I, I think that, that we need to uh, come back in four years and, and say... <laughs> We finally figured it out. You know, there's no excuse for why we can't figure it out. <laughs> Thank you. I know, Brian, you need to leave. So I'll please respond to the extent that you can, and then you, yeah. we will <laughs> wave farewell as you walk out. Yeah, I don't, I, don't know. I, I don't know that I can come up with a response that is uh, adequate for, for what we've heard. I do think, I wouldn't want anyone to think, I'm mean, speaking for myself, but uh, in being understanding of these as voter issues, I wouldn't want anyone to think that uh, if there are bad actors, or if there are areas that um, administration is not the way it should be, that that's not 
in any way acceptable. I don't want, wouldn't want anyone to think that. I think that the eye-opening thing for, for me was that that exists. Um, I would say, though, that in defense of election administrators in general, uh, I, I wouldn't, I do think that election are ran very well. I think election administrators do a great job. Uh, and so uh, addressing the exceptions, whether that's an exception of a, a group of voters, whether that's an exception in locality, I think makes a lot of sense. And I think that's what the EAC is, um, is, is poised to do in terms of just raising uh, uh, best practices overall. I do think that, you know, we get a lot of talk about security, and that's a big deal. But these operational issues are the most important that all election administrators face. And I, and I think these are operational issues. I think they're very personal issues. Uh, I've been on the other end of phone calls and conversations um, in, in areas that may be considered well represented or well served and still had uh, those same kinds of conversations. So I know what those are like. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't know how else to, to say it other than I think that uh, from my own standpoint, we're focused on trying to address these through our best practice uh, initiatives that we're going to roll out, and, and I will bring all this back to our commissioners, the, including the new ones, and we'll have discussions. Um, I want to talk specifically to the <clears throat> bad actor issue very briefly. Although the report will be coming out, and you'll see the aggregated data, which is you know how change happens when people see in real hard numbers what the situation really is, we will append the transcripts to these hearings. And I encourage you, if you or your staff have the time, to go through them to hear the stories that Jacqueline just talked about. And think of all the people, most of whom had to drive incredibly far and asked for gas money to get there, to share these incredibly painful stories of how they were treated at the polls. Because behind every little data point is a person who shared some information with complete strangers in a room like this that are moving the ball forward and that you'll never meet them. And so I think that's really extraordinary, but I would like to suggest that for anybody watching and for anybody here in the room, that we have, every state should have, I took an Uber here today, you can rate your driver and they rate you. Why should poll workers not have an identifying number and you be able to call someone if that person said or did something to you that you need to follow up on? There should be a mechanism in every single state where you can do your comment card, to use a real OG 1980s term. If you need a comment card, fine. If you have web-based feedback, whatever you want to do, every single one of them needs to have an identifier and some feedback because 10 years of litigation started in Alaska because of one poll worker telling one native person they were not allowed to bring their grandmother into the polling place. Don't let that be you. Well, uh, yeah, we, bad actors need to be dealt with. And make no mistake, my comments were not trying to at all rationalize that all election officials are, are, are perfect and are good and their, their hearts are pure. Uh, like any, any population in any group, we're not monolithic and, and there's, it's all over the map and, and we've got to hold those, those bad actors accountable. Um, I guess the, that both sides, um, we need to accept responsibility and, um, and c approach this with an open mind that the litigation brought may be telling a bigger story and not necessarily, for me, don't assume it's partisan. And on the other side, um, I challenge you to change your paradigms too and realize that not all election officials are acting with malice or are trying to, uh, to on either side, either uh, suppress voters or, or help their party in, in some way with their actions. And, and really, let's, let's get to the heart of the issue and let's, let's make sure that in you know, 2019, we're not having these kind of stories. I mean, for God's sakes, it's 2018. We should not be talking about how people can get registered to vote. We shouldn't be talking about a voter showing up at a polling place and not being able to cast a ballot. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't be talking about provisional ballots, for God's sakes. These are things that I thought we solved, you know, in 1993, in 19, uh, 2003, when we passed federal legislation. We shouldn't be having these conversations in the modern era. We shouldn't have polling place lines. We should be able to make sure that every American has a chance to cast a ballot in every election. It's that simple, and that's what we need to be doing. And like I said, I really appreciate all of you. Thank you, Secretary Wyman. Thanks to everybody uh, here in the room, and thanks to the live stream audience. 
And I, I should also acknowledge that our co-chair was Secretary-elect Jocelyn Benson from Michigan, who's not here today. So thanks, everyone. We'll have one last session to close out after the live stream ends. So see you in a few seconds.